Welcome to another video. I'm Dave and this time I'm sick. But that doesn't stop me from talking about some interesting VEX workflows. This time I'm touching multiple topics. Sorting with code, controlling data in arrays and some fancy vector math. And to visualize all of that, I'm starting with a simple curve. It doesn't really matter how this curve looks, I just need a simple shape. And I want to have a bit more control over the amount of points, so I will create a resample node. And just for good measure, I set this to subdivision curves and increase the maximum segment length to something above 0.3. And that looks about right. For this example, I only need the points with a good spacing in between. So to single out the points, I simply create an add node and here I can toggle delete geometry, but keep the points. So far so good. Now let's start with the preparation for what I want to do. I'm going to create an attribute wrangle and call this one the initialize. And in here, I'm going to create the p scale attribute. If you copy objects to a point, this attribute determines the scaling of the object. As I said, I wanted to create a simple sorting algorithm in VEX. But to have something to sort, I first need to create something random. So to create the p-scale attribute on each point, I'm going to use the good combination of fit01 and the rand function. The rand function itself is going to create a value from 0 to 1 and by using the input of the point number and the random value, this will be a different result for each point and with fit 0 I can change the range of that value. And I'm changing it to something like point 0 0.02 and point 0.2. Now it would be helpful to see how this affects the objects that we later copy on those points. So let's create the picket test geometry, deselect the shader, we don't need that and create a copy to point sop. Connect the points to the second input and the picket in the first input. And as you can see, all the pickets have different sizes according to their p scale. And you can also see that there is no visible order of the scale. It's completely random. But it would probably look a bit more interesting if the pickets are looking into the direction of the curve. So go back to the resample node and down here activate the tangent attribute and set this to n. By doing that, each point normal is following the curve. By default, the copied objects use the point normals to orient themselves. So this is a quick and easy way to control that. But by doing that, the result we get in the viewport gets a bit weird. So just for fixing that, we create a normal node after the copy and now the heads look right again. The next step for this process is to initialize arrays that we will use for the sorting algorithm. For that we need a bit more space, so let's pull all these nodes a bit down and let's create another wrangle. This wrangle we call init arrays and quite important, this is set to detail. That means it doesn't run over all the points automatically. We have to create that loop by ourselves, but sometimes it makes more sense to work in detail mode. The advantage is that you have all the variables and data available on all the iterations. So first I'm going to create three arrays. The first one will be used to save the index of each point. Then the array ps sort will save the p-scale values. And the third array will hold the original positions for each index. As you can see here in the geometry spreadsheet, since the wrangle is turned to detail, we can immediately find these arrays in the spreadsheet. But now we also have to fill them. For that we create a for loop running over all the points. And for the first array, on each iteration we're going to append the counter variable i. Since this loop basically goes through all the point numbers, we get an array that has all the points in it. Then we also need to fill the p-scale array. Since we already prepared the p-scale attribute on the points, we can extract that information with the point function. Again using the counter variable i to address the current point. Then again use the append function to add that value into the array. And finally we are also going to fill the pos sort array. Again I use the point function to grab the position of the current point. But in this moment you will find a little pitfall. It doesn't give me an error, but if I check the geometry spreadsheet, the detail tab is empty. It might be a bug that I don't get an error right here. But even so we don't see it, this wrangle now definitely has an error. 
And the reason for that, if we check the documentation for the point function, the returning data type is not specified. The reason for that is that you can read any attribute with the function and an attribute could have any data type. Now the key is the append function wants to add a new element to an existing array. That new element needs to have the same data type as the array. The array post sort is a vector array. So the append function can only append vector data. And even so the attribute p will return a vector at runtime. That doesn't help us right now, because at the moment the returning value of the point function has not a declared data type. You could use a helper variable like I used before with float scale. I could simply write vector pos one line before and then write the result of the point function into pos. But you don't have to do that. You can specifically declare the result of this point function as a vector. To do that you simply have to write vector in front and capsule the point function in parentheses. After doing that you will notice that the geometry spreadsheet in the detail tab now again shows the arrays. But not only that, they are also filled with data. In the index sort we find all the point numbers, the positions sort holds all the position information, while the ps sort holds all the p-scale values. With all of that prepared we can continue with the first real task. The sorting algorithm that allows us to put the p-scale values in the right order. So let's create another attribute wrangle. We call it simple sort and this one is also set to detail. Now there are quite a lot of different methods to sort your data. One of the more simple ones is called the bubble sort and that's the one we're going to implement. As always first I will need some helper variables and since the wrangle is in detail mode I'm going to need to create a loop. This time instead of directly using the amount of points that come in through the first input, I'm using an external channel so that I can control the amount of iterations this algorithm will take. This will contain a nested loop and this channel controls the amount of iterations on the outer loop. To work properly we will need exactly the amount of points, but I want to be able to also see how the algorithm reacts with lesser iterations. As I said this will have a nested loop, so let's create the second one. This one will use the amount of points. Now what is the bubble sort? It's fairly simple. We take the next value that is to come and compare it with our current value. Depending on the sorting direction, ascending or descending, you make a switch depending on the result of that comparison. I want to get the biggest picket on the far left. So whenever the next scale is bigger than my current scale, I want to make a switch. Let's see if everything is working so far. It doesn't, so I probably have a typo somewhere. Oh, there it is. I missed the spacebar right here. Before I make any changes, let's take a last look at the geometry spreadsheet. The PS sort array is in a complete random order and we want to change that. But it will not help us to only sort this array. We also have to remember which point had this value. And a possible solution for that is to keep that information in the index sort. So every switch we are going to make with the ps sort, we are also going to make with the index sort. And this is how you manage the switch of elements in the same array. We already saved the next value in the variable next scale. That means we can already overwrite that element. So the place where the next scale was saved was ps sort with the index y plus 1. Now we write the current element into that spot. And after doing that the current spot with the index of only y is free to hold the next scale. As I said we need to do all these changes in the same way for the index sort array. By doing that we are able to retrace the changes we made. And the steps are exactly the same. First we save the next value in a helper variable, then we write the current element into the next spot and then write the saved next value in our current spot. And that's all there is to a simple bubble sort. Let's check the spreadsheet to see if we got the right results. And by the looks of it we did. The ps sort array is now sorted from the biggest value to the lowest while we made the same changes for our point numbers in the index sort array. 
Now, obviously, this might be an interesting exercise to learn how to create a sorting algorithm, but being in Houdini, this makes only sense if we're going to do something with it. And what we're going to do is to animate the pickets from their original randomized order to their new sorted order. In this case, I want to use a solver, because I want to have a very versatile solution for this. To see what happens inside the solver, I pin the current viewport, jump inside the solver, and I want to have access to the data from the previous frame. But that data doesn't exist on the first frame. So we need to create a quick solution for that single frame. One way to do that would be the switch node. Type in $frame equals 1, which will be true on the first frame which only then returns one and chooses the second input of the switch node. On all other frames, this is not true, so we have the first input, the previous frame node. If we are coming from the previous frame node, we also want to create a transition, the transition from the original position to the new one. So create another attribute wrangle. Again, turn this one to detail and open the editor. I'm going to need at least one helper variable to hold the current active direction. And for this operation, I'm only going to need the index sort and the position sort array that I haven't touched yet. I am on detail, so again, create a for loop. This time I'm going to take the length of the array to decide the amount of iterations, which is still basically the same as using the point number. Here is a little trick, I don't want all the pickets to move at once. So I build in a simple condition. I take the current frame and check if it's bigger than my counter variable for the loop and multiply that by 10. The idea is that for example that point 2 only starts to move until the frame is bigger than 20. Now here's how you get the data you need. First we need the current point we want to move. And the first point we try to move is the first element of the index sort array now just called R. Then we need its target position, and that's the purpose of the position array. This array holds all the original positions, meaning the first element holds the position of the previous point zero. Then we grab the position of the point we try to move and use that to calculate the direction we have to push it towards. We want to get a normalized vector that's pointing from the moving point towards its target. So take that point and subtract the point's position. Now to implement that movement, we take the position and add the active direction we just created. But I recommend to create a multiplier to be able to manipulate the speed at which the points are moving. With the current scaling of this project, I felt 0 0.04 is a good value. Again, we are on detail, so we cannot just type add p. We have to use the function setPointAttrib to tell that point its new position. If I made no mistake, we should already see some movement. So let's press play and see that I did make a mistake. Like not remembering how you named your attributes. With that out of the way, we finally have some movement. But something seems to be a little bit off. Yes, the pickets seem to move to the right spots. But once they arrive at that spot, they start to wiggle. And that's because we never tell our points to stop moving. We always try to move in the active direction. So to stop the wiggle once we reach our target position, we can create a condition that takes the distance of the target position and the current position. And only if that's bigger than the defined speed, then we change the position. If not, so else, we set the position to the target position. Basically jump directly to the finish line. That seems to do the trick for the wiggle. Now all our pickets move to their designated spots and they wait their turn to move. But this animation looks a bit boring. So let's make it a bit more dynamic and random. So let's create a new vector, a random direction, and we create that random vector with the function rand and provide the iteration counter as a good practice with an additional random value. Then to control the transition itself, we want to create a value from 0 to 1. We will need that for the lerp function. To get that, we use the fit function and take the data that currently controls the animation. And that is the current frame if it has a value of the iteration counter times 10, because only then our points start to move. We can define how long this transition is going to be by adding the target value on top. Just as an example, that transition could last 48 frames. And from that data, I want to get a new value from 0 to 1. With this transition value prepared, we can now take our active direction 
and overwrite it with the result of a lerp function. The lerp function takes two vectors and the transition value. The result of the function will be depending on the value in the transition variable. If it's zero, we get the random direction. If it's one, we get the active direction. If it's something in between, we get a blended direction. Now, if we hit play on this, each picket starts to float into a random direction. But then it will slowly change that random direction to a movement that will lead it directly to the target position. I last comment on the seemingly bad performance. When I start the simulation from scratch, you will notice that the pickets move kind of slow. But that's only the case because we really are pushing quite a lot of points around. You tend to forget that even the picket has quite a lot of points, especially if you use 21 copies of them. When we activate the pack and instance option in the copy to points op, you will see that the operation itself is fairly easy to handle. Now this was just a simple example how to use this workflow. I could imagine that there is quite a lot of potential for this idea. Particle movement, custom forces and others. For example, if we deactivate the add node and set the visibility flag on the solver itself, we could create a polyline in complete disarray. And this animation backwards would solve this chaos and create a smooth line again. I hope you all found this useful and are back next time. And as a new custom, this hip file will be available for all the patrons. Cheers! Then I try so bad to keep my head right above the water.